Welcome to Reasonable Faith Dallas channel. My name is Sean Mixon. I am also the Thought Decoder. Today we are joined by the legendary, the man, the myth, the legend, none other than Dr. William Lane. Craig, let's give him a hand clap, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Craig, uh, to say that I am excited and elated and just outside of myself to 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 be on a interview with you uh it would be an understatement your work uh your thoughts your method i mean has has been with me for the past 10 years i've devoted hours of listening to your lectures uh hours of watching your defenders class up and down the freeway while i was at the house i mean a weekend listening to debates over and over and over again they have just informed uh everything about what it means to be an apologist what it means to be a christian and even your your character uh, within the face of hostile adversaries is is commendable as well so thank you for being on with us today well it's a privilege uh the dallas reasonable faith chapter is our flagship chapter with reasonable faith and so we go back a long way, and I really have tremendous admiration for the fine job you folks are doing. Well, thank you again, Dr. Craig. Uh, Dr. Craig, today we want to talk about uh, biblical uh, doctrine uh, as far as evidence for the Trinitarian view. I recently saw a discussion that you did with Dr. Dale Tuggy, and you mm -hmm. presented a biblical doctrine and evidence for biblical doctrine of the Trinitarian view, which most people may say, hey, well, don't we base this on the creeds? Uh, so we just have a series of questions that we want to let you lay out your case today and kind of build some background knowledge for, for those of us who are not as familiar with theology. So could we start by uh, asking, answering the question rather, what is a doctrine? The word doctrine is a translation of the Greek term didaskalia, which means teaching. And so in Scripture, you find that the ministry of the local church typically involves teaching as a central component. And in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching. That is didaskalia, mm -hmm. profitable for doctrine. So doctrine is what the scriptures teach and what we as Christians believe. Okay, so doctrine is what the scriptures teach and what we believe. Uh, so how do we determine whether uh, scripture teaches a particular doctrine? Uh, because Obviously, we see so many d different denominations in the in the United States and around the world uh, and within Christendom. And we all have the same Bible, as they say. So what's going on here? How do we determine what what well, Scripture this teaches? Is a very delicate and difficult issue because it gets into the question of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. How do you determine the teaching intent of a passage of Scripture. And this is really important for doctrines of biblical authority because Christians who believe in the biblical authority uh, and inerrancy um, generally will say that the Bible is true in all that it teaches. Now, that means there can be things in the Bible that are not true, but they're not part of the teaching of Scripture. So one of the most famous examples would be when Jesus says that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds, then you can do great things for the kingdom of God. And it would be silly and pedantic to point out that the mustard seed is not literally the smallest of all seeds and that therefore mm. this is an error in the Bible because mm. Jesus is not teaching botany there. He's teaching okay. a lesson about faith. And so it's important to determine what is the teaching intent of Scripture. And that's a difficult question that will have to be weighed passage by passage as you uh, apply grammatical historical exegesis to the uh, passage 
to determine what the author means to affirm. And of course, as you compare different authors and different passages with one another, uh, then sometimes it will become clearer when you have a central teaching uh, emerge from Scripture uh, that is not just based on an isolated passage, but is based on a, a number of different passages by different authors. For example, uh, the teaching that Jesus Christ died for our sins would be an example of a, a central teaching of the New Testament that you can find uh, um, in many different passages. Okay, so it seems that 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 doctrine of inerrancy or that view of inerrancy would be consistent with there being certain uh, uh, biological bi botany uh, errors or uh, er you know certain incorrections within the scriptures that are not related to what is actually being taught there. Yes, I think that's right. I would prefer to use the word falsehood rather than error because I think that it's only an error if it means to teach this and mm. it's mistaken. Okay. But a falsehood okay. in something that it doesn't intend to teach, I don't think counts as an error. So as I say, I think it would be just pedantic to say that it's an error when Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds because it's not part of his teaching in that passage. Hmm. I guess it's kind of like uh, looking at Jesus's parables and saying, well, since there were no people, there was no certain man, then, then what, what he said is. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of that. But when Jesus says something like there was a certain man who went down to Jericho and you say, well, there never was such a person. This is an error. That would be silly. Yeah. Because that's not the teaching of the passage. The teaching is mm. about neighborliness and what it mm -hmm. means to uh, be a good neighbor. Yeah. Wow. So so we're getting the ball rolling here. So in theology, what are the different kinds uh, mm. of theology that, that are out there? There are quite a number of different branches or types of theology. Most basic, I think, would be biblical theology. And this would be the work of Old and New Testament scholars to determine what is the teaching of various biblical authors or books of the Bible or the Bible as a whole. This will be the closest related to exegesis. Now, in addition to that, there is so-called historical theology, which will be a study of the development of doctrine down through church history how the doctrine, for example, of the Trinity developed, or the two natures of Christ, or the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. Uh, the historical theologian will study the great figures and periods of Christian history to determine what giants of the faith have said in the past about these things. Then there's the work of philosophical theology, which is the area that I'm mainly involved in, which involves philosophical reflection upon the truth claims of the Christian religion, philosophical reflection upon the nature and existence of God. For example, the scripture affirms that God is almighty, but what does that really mean philosophically? Or what does it mean when the scripture affirms that God is eternal or that God is everywhere present? Those are profound philosophical questions that biblical theologians and historical theologians mm. are typically not well trained or positioned to answer. But the philosophical theologian can contribute to these discussions. And then summing all of these up, that we've talked about so far would be systematic theology, which tries to draw upon the disciplines of biblical, historical, and philosophical theology to present a coherent formulation of Christian doctrine and of a Christian worldview. Hmm. So what uh, that raises some other questions in my mind, but 
let's uh, press forward because I, w- I would be interested in seeing what is the skill set with the system systematic theology? It seems like it's some type of integrative method. Oh, I, I really agree with you, Sean. And I think that's what makes this discipline so difficult. Mm. You've got to have your biblical languages in order to do good systematic theology. You need to have the tools of the biblical theologian of reading the, the Greek and the Hebrew um, texts of the Old and New Testament. And then you need some knowledge of historical theology and the development of doctrine, because we don't begin every generation de novo. We stand mm-hmm. on the shoulders of giants and we profit from their insights and also, I think, correct their mistakes when we sense they've gone astray. And then, as I just mentioned, the philosophical theologian will be drawing upon conceptual analysis, um, logical argumentation, um, and a systematic presentation of a worldview to contribute to the philosophical coherence of the systematic theologian's work. So it's really hard to do systematic theology well. And I think you'll find um, that when you look at contemporary systematic theologies, they're typically deficient in at least one, if not more, of those areas. Wow. Wow. That's, That's very interesting. It seems like there should be a push for theologians, not just to study biblical languages, but to study uh, something of what classical thinkers call the trivium uh, Ah. and and introduce logic into seminaries. Like all seminary students should study logic. Yes, Alvin Plantinga, the great Christian philosopher, has said that every theologian needs to put in some store of modal logic if he's to do his work well. And, (laughs) And I think that's good advice. Okay, so as the systematic theologian works with and within all of these various disciplines to to come up with with some uh, systematic theology, what is the relationship between that endeavor and the idea that as a, a society and knowledge and technology moves forward, that we need to continually mm speak to the culture and speak to our mm-hmm. world, given our yeah. current knowledge. I've, I've read that this is uh, called by some theologians as developmental theology. Uh, what, what is your response to that? The systematic theologian Paul Tillich, a uh, prominent 20th century theologian, um, emphasized that the best systematic theology will proceed by the method of correlation where it will attempt to address in its own way the most important issues of its day. And so there will be a definite apologetic um, aspect to Christian theology. It's not done in a vacuum, but rather it is renewed every generation Mm. in order to be relevant to the concerns of uh, each successive generation. And and so I've tried to do that in the systematic philosophical theology that I'm currently writing to be uh, current and abreast of philosophical work on these subjects so as to address them responsibly. Okay, great. Uh, Is the claim that the Bible teaches that there are three persons who are, are each properly called God a deduction of biblical theology? Or, or systematic theology, or both, or neither? Well, I do think it's a conclusion of biblical theology. That was the point I was making in my dialogue with Dale Tuggy. He, as a Unitarian, uh, is uh, very critical of the creedal formulations of the doctrine of the Trinity at Nicaea, or Constantinople, for example. And so what I wanted to do was to go right back to the New Testament texts themselves and see what they teach 
in regard to this subject. And while everyone agrees that the New Testament does not teach a full-blown doctrine of the Trinity, such as is articulated at the Council of Nicaea, nevertheless, I think that the New Testament does teach the following. Namely, there is exactly one God, and there are exactly three persons who are properly called God. And so that would be, I think, a conclusion of biblical theology and would count, I think, as a biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if I might just comment oh, a ahead. bit on that definition. Okay. Critical to it is the word properly. Mm -hmm. It is clear that in Scripture, many non-divine beings are improperly called God. Um, angels, uh, the Hebrew king, uh, intermediary figures can be called Elohim, God, mm -hmm. uh, so that through hyperbole and metaphor and other rhetorical devices, um, you can have beings that are improperly called God. But when I say there are exactly three persons that are properly called God, uh, what I mean there is uh, in truth or truly, um, that this is not a matter of hyperbole or rhetoric, but they are in truth called God. Uh, it seems as, as if the Apostle Paul even mentioned that some some of his contemporaries during his day were worshiping demons <laughs> who they called who they thought to be gods i, I always yes. thought that was an interesting interesting point that uh paul <laughs> yeah paul was no religious inclusivist <laughs> when you look at his attitude toward the greco-roman religions of his day he didn't think that these people were accessing God in a different way. He said these are doctrines of demons and that what the mm -hmm. pagans worship are actually demonic yeah. beings. So Paul was no religious inclusivist. Yeah, so it, it's it's he was very bold, I guess. He I guess he wouldn't fit in in our times. Uh <laughs> no. So what what would we say about church creeds? Are are church creeds biblical doctrines? No, I think everyone would agree that they are not biblical doctrines. They are extrapolations from biblical doctrines, or they are formulations um, of doctrines using the raw material of the Bible. Um, and therefore, I do not, as a Protestant, regard the creeds as authoritative for Christian doctrine. I think that the scripture and the scripture alone is our authoritative source for Christian doctrine. But I would see the creeds as being what the theologian Michael Byrd has called a consultative norm for doing theology. That is to say, although scripture is the authoritative norm for theology, we can consult the creeds to see what the great Christian thinkers down through the ages and the consensus of the uh, Christian church and the ecumenical councils has been concerning these doctrines. And I think that we uh, ignore what they say at our own peril. We need to take very seriously um, what the Christian church has said about these various doctrines and that come to expression in these creeds. But I don't think the creeds are, in the end, uh, authoritative. I think they're a consultative norm. And when they depart from Scripture, then I think we are quite right to call them before the bar of Scripture and to correct them if needs be. So in exploring theology, uh, some of the scholars discussed the role of a theologian and, and one of the tasks were to take the beliefs of lay members, lay Christians, and to try to e evaluate them in terms of their uh, 
are they necessary beliefs to be a Christian? Are they mm -hmm. uh, exter Are they just contingent that you can believe it or not believe mm -hmm. it and still maintain a Christian? In terms of the doctrine of the Trinity, where do we place mm. this? That's uh, in the way a really belief? difficult question, uh, Sean. I mean, obviously, a person doesn't need to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity in order to be saved and going to heaven. Abraham, for example, didn't believe mm. in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, <laughs> but he did believe in the promise that God had given him, that he would become the father wow. of many nations and have a posterity and a land. And so God counted it to Abraham as righteousness. So Abraham responded in faith to the revelation of God that he did have. So the question would be, is belief in the doctrine of the Trinity necessary for salvation to anyone living in the post-Pentecostal age who both is informed of and understands the Trinity? If someone wow. both is informed of and understands the Trinity and yet rejects it, then I do tremble for that person's salvation. But I don't want to take a hard and fast line here because of a particular phenomenon, and that is this. There are these oneness Pentecostals who believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They think that Jesus Christ is God, the Father, incarnate. And so they do believe in the deity of Christ, his historical resurrection, his substitutionary atonement, but they don't believe in the Trinity. And I'm really reluctant to sort of write them out of the kingdom. I think that would be presumptuous on my part, because the New Testament nowhere asks us to confess the person of the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. It asks us to confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, and that God raised him from the dead, and then you will be saved, Paul says in Romans 10. But it doesn't say explicitly that you need to confess the Holy Spirit. And so mm. is it possible that these oneness Pentecostals could be saved, even though their doctrine is so twisted and distorted because they don't recognize the deity or personhood of the Holy Spirit. I, I hope for their sake that that's possible. So that's my only reservation. Oh, wow. Wow. They've heard that one before. Uh, so let's get into this, this biblical doctrine of the Trinity, uh, mm -hmm. what, what is the case? What is the biblical case? How do you go about uh, presenting this case? What's your method here? The method I use in the systematic philosophical theology I'm writing is to first show that the scriptures consistently teach monotheism, Jewish monotheism. There is exactly one God and no more. Then the next thing you want to show is that the scriptures teach that the Father is God, that Jesus Christ is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God. And that's not difficult to do. All three of them are explicitly called theos, uh, which is the Greek mm. word for God, even ha theos, the God. And then the final step will be to show that they are distinct persons, that the Father is not the same person as the Son uh, or as the Holy Spirit, that they are three distinct persons. And there are many verses in the Bible where the persons interact with each other. Uh, for example, at the baptism of Jesus, you have God the Father uh, speaking, uh, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, and then the Holy Spirit descends upon the Son and anoints him for ministry. That would be a good example of where you have the three in a single passage. Or in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, when Jesus says to go into all the world and preach the gospel, 
uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, th there you see, again, the three persons listed. So that would be the case for a biblical doctrine of the Trinity, how it would be constructed. And so what what about some uh, objections? I want to move into the ob objections to it, and I'll I'll let you provide some of them. But I've heard it said that the, the Gospel of John, when it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, uh, that in the Greek, uh, I believe it's Mormons who say that that's a, 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 an error in our translation, that that should say mm -hmm. a God, and there was a God. Uh, d what would you say to someone who said, look, the Bible in the Greek, it says and Jesus was a God. So even if he's even if he preexisted, this still means that he is subordinate yeah. in some sense. Yes, that's actually, I believe, Jehovah's Witnesses who say that. And hmm. this view okay. is of no merit whatsoever. The, the translation that uh, the logos or the word was a God is without merit by having no article in front of the word logos or, or pardon me. By having no article in front of the word theos, it shows that the logos is the subject of the sentence, even though in the word order it comes after theos. Uh, it, it, God was the word. Um, the mm -hmm. subject is ha logos, the word. And the lack of the article shows that theos is the predicate nominative. Mm -hmm. Moreover, it also shows, I think, that the emphasis is on the nature of the Logos, that the Logos is divine, mm. uh, just as God the Father is divine. And confirmation of this is that later in John 1.18, when John says, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. There it does use the article with Theos, and similarly, in the Christological climax of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, the appearance to Thomas and mm -hmm. the other oh, 11 oh, disciples, God. Thomas, seeing the risen Lord, falls at his feet and says, my Lord and my God. And that is with the definite articles, uh, ha kurios mu, kai ha theos mu, the Lord of me and the God of me. So clearly, point, I agree. yeah, these Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses uh, have no merit to their translation of uh, Logos, or, or rather Theos without the article as a God. Okay, so what are, what are some objections to the uh, biblical case that you've, you've just laid out? <laughs> I don't think there are any good objections. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's just as plain as day that the Bible teaches there is exactly one God and that there are exactly three persons who is each called God. The, the best case against this would be the case that a Unitarian like Dale Tuggy tries to bring, where he shows or tries to show that the statement that the Father is God is an identity statement, that this identifies the Father with God. And therefore, if the Son is identified with God, that would identify the Father with the Son, that they're the same. And here we need to understand the difference between um, the is of identity and the is of predication. When we say, Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens. That is an is of identity. But when I say Donald Trump is the president, that is not an is of identity because Barack Obama is also the president. So is Joe mm. Biden. So that would be a, a predication of the role of president or the office of the president to Donald Trump, but it's not an identity statement. So when the Bible says the Father is God or Jesus is God, I think these are not identity statements. These are predications. It is a way of saying 
that the Father is divine and the Son is divine and the Holy Spirit is divine. Um, and one of the most interesting insights and reflections that I've had on this was when I was sitting in the hospital for five days with coronavirus and nothing to do, my wife Jan said to me, why don't you think about a philosophical problem while you lie there? And so wow. that was what I did. I thought about the relation of identity and these Trinitarian statements in the New Testament. And what I came to realize is that the modern notion of identity, of the logical relation of identity, mm -hmm. wasn't even grasped in the ancient world. Um, mm. Particularly, it wasn't grasped by New Testament theologians. So to impart or read into these first century documents a modern interpretation of identity statements is grossly anachronistic. Uh, and I do not think that they intended these at all to be taken in the modern uh, sense of logical identity. Okay. What would you say if someone mentioned, like, uh, or asked rather if Aristotle had a grasp of the concept of uh, identity? Oh, wow. Well, Sean, you're very sharp. I, I uh, did speak <laughs> by generalization. Uh, because Aristotle is the one person who in a couple of sentences <laughs> in his, I think it's in his categories, he does anticipate the modern notion of identity. But that insight was lost. Uh, wow. William and Martha Neal in their book, uh, The History of Logic, say that uh, this insight into modern identity theory was lost. It wasn't appreciated by Aristotle's contemporaries. His successors didn't understand it. And it wasn't until much, much later that the modern relation of identity was fully explicated and understood. So you're right. Aristotle, in a couple of sentences, does anticipate this doctrine. But it was not generally known and certainly not known by the pastors and missionaries who wrote the New Testament. Okay, uh, so that's pretty much the biblical uh, case that you that you lay out. And uh, would you be open to taking some questions about your your work in other areas? Sure, of course. Okay, uh, so what is a proposition on your view? Given your view of abstract objects, what is a pro okay? Because I've I've seen you use the word. I don't know what you mean by it anymore. Once you once you reject yes, abstract objects, I think that the best way to understand a proposition is it's the information content of a declarative sentence. So a sentence is a linguistic item that might be in English or German. Um, and these sentences can have the same information content. So if I say snow is white, that expresses the same proposition as the German sentence, der Schnee ist weiss. Even though these two sentences have no words in common, they have the same information content. And so philosophers say that they express the same proposition. And propositions are typically thought to be true or false. Um, and then there's a whole question about whether or not propositions really exist, or are they just sort of make-believe uh, things of reason that we uh, invent to talk about the content of sentences. Okay. And where do you fall? I, I, I know you, you, you reject abstract objects. Uh, this, so this is my understanding of, of, of your, your uh, view on this. Uh, scripture teaches that God is the sole ultimate reality. Yes. Uh, there's no reason to accept. Uh, there are no good arguments to accept the uh, view that there are abstract objects exist. And you you attack uh, Quine's uh, argument that he gave for the existence of, of abstract objects. And uh, from there, would you say that information and content of sentences, of declarative sentences, was a concrete object? Would it have to be a concrete object, or would it, if it didn't exist? No, I, I think it's just a, a way of speaking. It's it's uh, 
a fiction that we uh, make believe exists <laughs> so that we can talk about the content of the sentence and its truth or falsity. Um, but I don't think we need to say that there are actual objects out there that really exist independently of minds um, like propositions. Mm. And my mm. primary okay. objection to them, as I say, or as you just said, is theological, namely they would contradict what I conceive to be the biblical teaching that God is the sole ultimate reality, that anything apart from God has been created by God. And propositions are typically thought to be necessary, eternal, and uncreated, and therefore I think are theologically unacceptable. All right. Very good. Thank you, sir. And so in your debate with Dr. Sean Carroll, Dr. Carroll, he seemed to presuppose a methodology of methodological naturalism. It, it seemed to mm -hmm. him, it's, when I watched the debate, it seems as if he's, he's, all of his critiques are like, hey, you're not using, you're not presupposing naturalism in your approach, Dr. Yeah. Craig. That's not the way we do things as physicists. And I was like, well, this is deba a debate and you have to give an argument. But he did mention one thing and, uh, and I, I, had, I did have a question about it. Can I just he, comment okay. first, though, yeah. on, on the point you just made? I think that's an important point. And I saw an excellent review of the debate uh, with the Australian uh, astrophysicist Luke Barnes, oh, where wow. Barnes points out this very fact and is quite impatient uh, with Carol about it. Uh, he says that Carol thinks of this sort of methodological naturalism as being the same as to say that nature exists. And mm. that this is therefore presupposed by science. We all uh, believe that nature exists and that's what science explores and investigates. And so naturalism is the sort of default position. And Barnes just, I think, drives a truck through that and says, the, the view that nature exists and is objective and that we investigate it is not what is meant by the philosophy of naturalism or the methodology of naturalism, as you point out. Well, and so he he seems to to bring up these models, the ability mm -hmm. of a physicist to construct a model. And one of his responses was that we can build models where the universe doesn't have a beginning. Yes. Now, if there is a model where the universe has a beginning, does that refute uh, the premise uh, that, I mean, how does that relate to your argument? I guess that's what I was trying to add it that. It's certainly true that cosmologists invent toy models of the universe all the time. This is almost, uh, one astronomer said to me, like recreation for them uh, to invent models of the universe. But that is only the beginning of the discussion. The question then will be, uh, what is the empirical fit of these models and the mathematical coherence of these models? They need to then be tested by their mathematical consistency and their fit with the empirical evidence of science. And when you try to do that, then I think you will find that there is no mathematically coherent and empirically adequate model of the universe uh, that is past eternal. Okay. Okay. So, so even if you grant, Dr. Carroll, that, that there are these constructions. Now mm -hmm. you have to ask the question, okay, well, let's now look at the data and see right. which model best fits the data, which is what yes. you argued in your, I mean, that's what you always argue that the best, that the best uh, model is the inflationary models and that, that the history of physics has, has bore this out uh, with, with the, the evidence is the uh, red shift uh, of the stretching of the planets between the, one another and other evidences uh, that, that have been provided. Uh, what, what's your response to that? 
Well, that's the point that I was just trying to make. You Mm -hmm. want to assess the models to make sure they're mathematically coherent or consistent. And then you want to determine their fit with the empirical data, that is the scientific data. Uh, And someone like Alex Vilenkin, for example, a very uh, prominent astrophysicist, uh, is ruthless in showing how these beginningless models, whether they are say, contracting from infinity and then re-expanding, or whether they are static uh, from infinity and then begin to expand at a point in the finite past, or whether they go through a series of cycles or oscillations. Again and again, he shows that these contradict the uh, empirical facts of physics, um, which has led some astrophysicists or mathematical cosmologists like Roger Penrose to invent models of the universe that operate according to different laws of physics, an Mm. alien physics that is not the physics of this universe. Uh, That's how bizarre and speculative these models can become when they don't even operate according to the known laws of physics. Okay. So what about singularities? Is a singularity a mathematical object or is it an actual state? Uh, suns, the, you know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Well, I, these are difficult interpretive questions. I'm inclined to say, and I think here I would be with the majority, is that this is just a mathematical artifice, that a, a mathematical singularity or point of infinite density and infinite space time curvature is not a physical state of affairs. It is a mathematical artifice of certain models. Um, and usually cosmologists will cut that out of the model. They will remove that initial singular point. So there is sort of a hole uh, back there mm. uh, where it used to be. Uh, and Many want to craft models that will involve a beginning of the universe where the beginning is not singular. Uh, for example, this is Vilenkin's own approach. Uh, also, the famous Hartle Hawking model of James Hartle and Stephen Hawking involve a finite past and a beginning of the universe, but it doesn't begin at a point of infinite density, a singular point. Okay. Uh, now t- t- transitioning to like questions about Christendom more, more broadly. Uh, what seems to, to be, do you think that God makes different individuals, uh, with, and gives them different gifts and that to be an intellectual person, you're, you're very, uh, you're, it's not a lot, so you're in the in a in a great minority uh, of people, and that when when the intellectual who is also a believer begins to try to apply his faith and his reason and and, and connect them, that since the majority of people are, are seem to be more uh, easily persuaded by emotionalism, mm-hmm. uh, that that's where the hostility uh, comes from in terms of. Uh, anti-intellectualism uh have you what what are your experiences with this like uh this this whole approach like you you don't need arguments you're you're in the wrong spirit you need to just let the spirit just lead us this 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 hostility toward i mean anything that 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 when you try to analyze like scripture and 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 Uh reality in terms of spiritual experience and you receive hostility uh, within those moments, what what are your experiences? This, how do you understand this uh, when people don't think you're you're spiritual, for example, because no. you're a philosopher? You know, well, I, I'm not sure if I understand the thrust of your question, but I would say that these attitudes that you're describing are very largely the sociological result of how a person was raised, uh, his home, his upbringing. Uh, how his parents educated him, and then how he was educated in the church and and primary school. So there may be some people that are just born geniuses that are just naturally endowed with certain qualities or talents. But I think 
for the most part, I would say that these are shaped by uh, nurture rather than nature. They're they're the result of how a person is raised. Mm. So have you experienced uh, people questioning your faith because of the intellectual uh, Mm. academic work that you you produce publicly? Mm. So they think no, they're more. I, I have not. Um, there may be some detractors out there, but I'm not aware of them. Mm. I have found quite the contrary that lay people are extraordinarily appreciative of what I'm doing, and that even if they don't understand it themselves, they are very glad that someone else is tackling these tough questions and defending the gospel intellectually. Okay. And then uh, finally, and we could we could end it after this one. Uh, I don't want to belabor your time. Uh, When was your when what was you tell us about your introduction to logic? Logic is so important to to logic. I've never heard you tell the story of how you came to fall in love. I I am kind of a late bloomer, Sean. I I was not a philosophy major. (laughs) In college, uh, I took some courses in philosophy, but I I didn't major in it. And so I had never had a logic course when I enrolled in my MA program in philosophy of religion at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And my departmental head and professor, Norm Geisler, said, if you're going to do an MA, in philosophy, you've got to have a course in logic. Uh, and so in addition to my normal course load that I took as part of the MA program, I went across the street to Trinity College, the undergraduate hmm. institution, and there took from the philosophy department uh, a course on intro to logic. And that was my first introduction and acquaintance with the rules of logic, which have just served me so well uh, in the years since. I kind of feel like one of your superpowers is your ability to extract another uh, and uh, the opponents, for for lack of better words, uh, their argument. And even Hmm. when you read a person's person's literature, you are able to evaluate and construct arguments so well. And when I read uh, Alvin Planninga, Planninga often says, what is the question? What's the claim? Like, (laughs) and and I, he'll say, what's, what's the claim here? I don't see a reason. Like, and it's, and I was like, this this is a genius, his ability to, to internalize this logical structure to where, okay, here's the conclusion. Here are the premises that get, get, get you there. And when I read your work and I, I see you in debates, I, I feel like this is your ability, even in your uh, your children's book for logic. I felt uh-huh. like you you put a lot of you put a lot of heavy, heavy uh, logical arguments in there and, and formal logical stru- structures for theological positions. Yeah. And I was like, look at this. Argue, this is crazy. It's right here. <laughs> and well, Alvin Planning has that. been my model. Uh, as well in in this. He is so marvelous in the way he can dissect an argument and expose its logical or, in many cases, illogical uh, Mm. structure and leaps in reasoning and so forth. So I I have tried to emulate uh, planting his great work and, and method. And that book that you mentioned for children learning logic, Uh, I wrote that for our own children Uh, when they were in high school one summer after lunch every day, we would sit around the kitchen table and I would teach uh, Charity and John and Jan one more rule of logic. And then I would Mm. make up these exercises and give it to them and they would fill them out and then we'd grade them and talk about them. And so that book was born out of our own experience in our family teaching logic to our kids. When you listen to someone speak, are you thinking about these rules of logic? Do they, oh, that's a Modus Tolan's argument. Like, <laughs> do you have some of this going on in the back of your oh, head? Oh, yeah, I, I do. I, uh, 
you can't help it when you listen to someone and you think, wait a minute, that, that doesn't follow or <laughs> confusing necessary and sufficient mm. conditions wow. here. And, and these things kind of pop out at you. Um, wow. So yes, when you, when you internalize these rules, then you do notice these mistakes that folks often make. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's absolutely awesome. Well, Dr. Craig, just let me say thank you uh, so much for this interview. I am going to, uh, uh, my future self, I'll need to ask for forgiveness because I know I'm going to think of some questions later that I, I didn't think of. <laughs> and, uh, but Dr. Craig, this has been a, a privilege and a pleasure having you on. And thank you all for watching. And I hope this uh, you enjoy this. And for more, continue to follow uh, Reasonable Faith. Uh, and we'll see you soon. And always remember to think better. <laughs>